welcome and thank you for joining our event today. Uh, I'm Jason Martin, the Chief Operating Officer here at Signet Health, where I lead the execution of our strategic goals and also ensure uh, successful delivery of all of our projects for customers. I've been working uh, in and around the data science and data management field for uh, over two decades and uh, start in bioinformatics and then uh, made a pivot into clinical development and have supported uh, execution of studies both inside a sponsor and from from a CRO and also from uh, other technology companies. So very excited to be able to help kick off and, and lead uh, the session with you today. We've gathered some thought leaders in clinical data management to discuss the complexities inherent in today's clinical research. So I think many of you probably know researchers today collect more data from more sources than we've ever had before. And you know this is due to a convergence of trends. There's increasing decentralization, as well as new regulatory and scientific requirements that, uh, to learn more about interventions, and they're leading to more and more sources of data. It's estimated that 50% of studies collect data using up to five disparate sources, and around 37% use six to 10 sources, and 13% use 11 or more data sources. So to start, we'd like to understand if uh, our audience here has observed the same trend. So we're going to conduct a live poll. You can participate by following the prompts on the screen. So if you would, um, go ahead and take a minute to respond. Instructions are at the top. You can text signet H866 to double two triple three and then answer from there. Now, statistically, it looks like we're getting close, maybe even skewing the distribution 11 to 15. It's a lot of sources. Let it go for another 30 seconds or so. Yeah, this poll will remain open as well. Uh, and we're going to have uh, some additional polls throughout the, um, the session. Uh, just you know, some general housekeeping. Um, we want to include your perspective as attendees. So you'll see these polls. We have a couple more. Keep your phone or web browser handy and just look for those instructions at the top. Uh, additionally, we'll have uh, an audience Q&A session at the end of the panel. Uh, discussion so you can look in your Zoom control panel for the Q&A button. Here you can submit questions for us, the panelists, and we'll address as many of them as we can. And at the end, you'll be sent a survey at the close of the event, and we would appreciate your feedback and we'll consider it in our next event. So let's get started. Our program today will outline the challenges clinical data and operational teams face. Then we'll compare the traditional data warehouse strategy with a newer approach that leverages data lake architecture to simplify ingestion and transformation of, the, of that data. From there, we'll show how AI, machine learning, and other advanced processing analysis tools will make it easier and faster for us to make critical decisions. Now, what I'll do is go ahead and introduce, uh, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. We have Jan, Christina, and Gail. Um, and if you would make a, a brief introduction and then we'll, we'll get started. Jan, do you wanna go ahead and do a self introduction? Yes. So thanks, Jason. So yes, hi, my name is Jan Bremens, I'm Senior Director for Analytics and I joined Signet Health beginning of the year and focus on anything that we are doing with data ag aggregation and analytics. Um, just as Jason, I've been in the industry for more than two decades, um, but I've only been on the sponsor side. And in that period, I've been having several functions, although majority of my time was also in um, being responsible for data management and partly clinical systems. Um, so maybe we can move over to the next slide and get started on the discussing the four Vs. We'll, we'll, we'll briefly, we'll, we'll get Christina and, um... And also Gail as well, huh. since they, they've got sessions. So we'll do Christina. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm Christina Dinger. I recently joined ThoughtSphere earlier this year. If you're not familiar with ThoughtSphere, 
It is a software as a service company that's focused on clinical data and analytics technology. Um, prior to joining ThoughtSphere, I worked in the CRO space for roughly 16 years. I started from the ground up as a clinical data coordinator in data management and then moved, moved on to hold various roles in data management, data science, central monitoring, and more recently, decentralized clinical trial operations. Um, in my current role at ThoughtSphere, I'm doing my best to leverage the operational experience I've gained over the years to really support the ThoughtSphere team, build out the product roadmap and create new features and enhancements to meet our customers' needs. Um, and I'm excited to be part of today's panel. So I look forward to speaking with you all. And we'll finish with Gail. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Gail Louis. I'm a senior director for the tech solution department at Signal Health. Uh, and basically my team is here to help our customer to handle their strategy when it comes to all these clinical data flow they have from the various systems. Could be signaled health systems, could be other clinical trial and other solutions. Uh, also, pharmaceutical background, used to be a data manager before going into the more solution provider side of the business. When we talk about electronic data capture, pharmacovigilance, IRT solution, but also warehouse and data lake management. Um, just like Christina and Jan, I'll, I'll be your, one of your presenters for today, and I really look forward for the presentation. Thank you. Excellent. So uh, let's get started. Jan will frame out the challenges inherent in clinical data management in today's medical research environment. Uh, take it away, Jan. Yes, thanks. Um, so yes, I think that you all know what's going on in the industry. Um, you're facing a situation where drug development is getting more and more complex um, and also cost increasing, of course. I mean, I think the last number we heard about uh, putting a drug on the market is around that it costs around 2.6 billion nowadays. Um, and a lot of that is because of the science and because of the regulations. We simply have to show so much more when it comes to showing drug efficacy, showing drug effectiveness compared to 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and that is no longer just about showing that we are effective, but it's also about showing that we can differentiate from, from our competition. And we need to look much more at many more angles than what we had to do in the past. And that means that we have so many more, uh, so much more endpoints nowadays. The second angle to that increase in complexity is actually the technology itself. Um, we have a lot of modern new technologies coming out. Um, we have, wearables, we have mobile health devices, and they have great benefits. I mean, they can help us collect data fast, real time, but in a way they're actually also adding up to the complexity that, that we have to deal with nowadays. And when we are talking about the complexity or translating that whole complexity to our data, we are talking about the four Vs today, sometimes about five Vs if you would be adding the value as well. Um, so let's maybe move uh, to the next slide. With this slide, I mean, we're, we're seeing here a quote from, from uh, Tufts Research, and we're talking here about the first two Vs that, that we have, volume and variety. Um, you, can, you can really see this. This is all about external data. Um, someone saying that we have way too many systems involved in the conduct of our clinical trials that do not communicate with each other and it's no longer as simple as locking an EDC system as it was so many years ago. Um, this is something that we know um, that it is indeed much, much, much more complex and that we have a lot more data, a lot, a lot more data coming from different data sources and it's an increasing variety, especially when we talk about the non-CRF data. And we indeed have a couple of um, nice numbers on that to prove that on the next slide. Um, so what you can see here is indeed that 97% of the companies says that we will continue to use more and more data sources over the next coming years. So whatever we have had in the past, I think we said, um, most people saying between six and 10 and 11 to 15 data sources. Well, guess what? It seems then that we're gonna be increasing that number over time as well. And not surprisingly, also 90% of companies have said that 
um, over the past decade, the number of endpoints has, has decreased quite substantially. Um, Jason already mentioned, I think, some of the numbers that we have on top, and that is that 50% of clinical trials, we are way above five, five different data sources. And for 13%, actually much more than 10. And I think actually what we have seen in our initial poll question, we are well above the 13%. So let's take a look at the next slide and take a look at the next two Vs then that we have, the velocity and veracity. Um, velocity is probably a term that speaks to itself. Um, the velocity is really about what is the speed that we are generating data nowadays? Um, what is the speed that we are that we see data coming in or that we can have data coming in. And with all modern technology, that speed is clearly increasing compared to in the past when we would be getting a lot of the external data or the non-CRF data fairly late in the game um, in a fairly or in a reasonably um, slow pace. And the veracity, that is something else. Veracity, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the term veracity. But the veracity is really pointing to the data integrity and the data quality. And of course, with many more data sources that are not talking to each other, um, it's becoming more and more complex to guarantee the data integrity and the data quality parts. So that's also what we see here on this quote. It's a lot about reconciliations late in the game that we are still struggling with, um, data review, then that we are still struggling with, that we are still struggling with late in the game and we have to make sure that, that we can do that holistic data cleaning on the next slide we again have a couple of numbers on that um, and interestingly although we have a lot of modern data sources and with modern data sources we would expect that we have good access to data 62 percent of, of uh, companies or 62 percent of people in a survey um, indicate that they actually have difficulty getting access to all of their clinical trial data. And that's quite substantial. Um, more interestingly is that actually some of the most modern data sources, mobile health, Internet of Things, we probably do a bit less, are probably the worst ones that to get data from. So that is not a good sign, actually. Um, also, when it comes down to the veracity, 58% uh, of, of uh, participants in the survey say that they lack confidence in quality and completeness of clinical trial data, which is quite substantial. And the 30%, which is like almost half of that previous population, is seeing that data quality as their biggest challenge. So those numbers are really pointing to quite a lot, a lot of challenges that we're having when we are putting data together um, to support our clinical trials. And that's how we look at the, the challenges that we are seeing today. Um, we are, of course, interested in getting your perspective as well. And for that, we also, we again have a poll question. Great, thanks, Jan. Um, so set, to set the stage for our next topic, uh, we'll ask this question. What are your organization's biggest challenges in terms of bringing data together? And if you could uh, just grab your phone or web browser and uh, pop some words on the screen, and we'll, we'll get a feeling for uh, how that is impacting yourself and your, your organization. Again, what are your organization's biggest challenges in terms of bringing data together? Covering the whole, I think the whole sphere of the challenge, you know, technology, um, where the data is, how it's stored, how organizations work together, uh, how the data is normalized, all of that. I, uh, I've lived those challenges and it sounds like many of you are too. So 
So um, thank you for, for uh, participating there. I think this segues nicely to our next topic. Christina is going to introduce, introduce us to data lake architecture and show us how it aggregates and transforms data more efficiently than the traditional and more standard data warehouse approach. So with that, Christina. Okay, yeah, that was a very interesting poll. And I think it speaks loudly to, you know, the plethora of data sources coming in um, and that be ch being challenging to aggregate and pull that information together or that data together to make information. But further from that, the downstream impact it has on our people and our processes. And I would argue that's almost a bigger challenge um, that we have to combat. And so let's go ahead and jump into the next slide and hopefully I can kind of show how through using data lake architecture and machine learning, we can hopefully tackle those challenges at both ends from data aggregation to streamlining processes. So, you know, we can all attest that, you know, all of these new data sources, everything that's coming at us, the new regulations, it's keeping us all on our toes. And we know we can't boil the ocean, but, you know, I think it's good to always keep in mind some guiding principles as we, you know, aim to turn kind of chaos into order and really modernize how we conduct clinical research. So first, um, you know, I think we must focus our energy on what we can control and accept what we can't. Any solution or approach that we devise and put forward has to meet the needs of more of the traditional study design that we will see operating today and that will continue into the future to support phase one and smaller studies. But we also have to support a patient centricity, you know, approach and the evolution and expansion of data sources and consumption of big data. Um, we know that that's coming more and more at us and that will continue to expand. Um, so we really have to, you know, think of all different study designs. And although, you know, a bespoke model will come into play when it's, you know, considering the data sources and modes of data collection that can be used, but that doesn't mean that the operational model or the downstream processes employed also have to be spoke and completely custom as well because we know that that is a huge burden on our staff and it really doesn't um, create consistency and quality. So second, when solutioning a problem, problem we have to keep the, men, the end in mind. And we all know that's crucial and important, but I think it sometimes gets lost with all the noise and everything going on. So really understanding what our end deliverables are to regulatory agencies. So knowing what our primary and secondary endpoints for the trial are and the submission data sets, you know, what looking at kind of the SAP analysis and how the data will be submitted and what the standard models of data submission are going to be used. And then streamlining all our processes and activities from the point of data ingestion to that end deliverable. And lastly, but definitely not least, as studies decentralize, we must centralize. Um, and this is just to say that in order to really um, make sense of the velocity and variety of the data coming in, a siloed approach to data reviews and processing is not a workable solution. And we saw that in the word cloud, you know, silos being a problem and reconciliation, right? Um, and so we really have, as the data, you know, a key piece is bringing the data together to create new insights but our systems and people and processes must also merge or consolidate. And so over the course of the next slides, I'll kind of speak about data lake architecture and the deployment of machine learning and AI um, and how that aligns with these guiding principles and um, helps us move the needle to modernizing clinical research. So next slide, please. So I'm not gonna go through all the bullets on this slide. You guys can definitely read those yourself. But let's just discuss and compare and contrast data lakes to data warehouses, which data warehouses have been around for, for a long time and data lakes are more of the new big data um, structure that allows you know, for data to be ingested in a uniform way across data domains. So data lake architecture is really promising and it's a recommended first step that aligns nicely with that first principle we just spoke about, about controlling what we can and accepting what we can't. 
Um, data lakes allow for ingestion of data just as it is, so without alteration or processing. Data lakes allow all modes of data to be stored in their original native form, which provides a low cost storage for high volumes of data or what we call big data. And by storing the data in its native form, contextual metadata um, or the syntax around the data that is often lost when we have to structure data to load into a data warehouse, it's now maintained and that can be leveraged downstream to provide additional insights into the data. A data lake also allows for the aggregation and transformation of the data to be performed once. So across all the data mediums in a unified and scalable way. Data lakes embedded with machine learning further optimize the data transformation and aggregation capabilities um, through auto mapping and algorithms that run <clears throat> and that can get more robust and accurate with each data source and study loaded. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, and just to you know, compare and contrast these a bit further, let's just walk through a schematic that illustrates the data flow where a data warehouse is utilized, because I know some people may have this background knowledge and others may not. So moving from left to right, data is first extracted and transferred through a resting API, or quite often it's loaded into secure file transfer portal. From there, it is then staged before it's loaded into a data warehouse. So each data source is staged through the API. It's through you know, the programming within the API. Um, but for secure file transfer portal, you know, documents that stored there, the content is usually written into Oracle tables or some other structured format before it's loaded into the warehouse. Then once the data is loaded, the data is available for various operational systems and reporting tools to use. However, since the data warehouse just stores the data, the data pulled from the warehouse is still disjointed and it must be brought together at the study ID level, at the patient level and further mapped so that the various sources are unified and interpretable. Um, so within each downstream reporting tool, additional data transformation has to be done. So using SQL or Java or another programming language um, such as SAS, you know, those that's required to create data analytics or dashboards and validation review outputs. And depending on the reporting tool that's utilized and its machine learning capabilities and how it's structured, um, joining the data at the study level across those different data domains and sources is often manual and has to be completed for every study. So kind of a bespoke, highly um, resource intensive process. So just in summary, in this flow, data transformation occurs twice in the process. And at both stages, you know, it's data, the data is never really unified in a way that is fit for cross-functional review. Additionally, um, oftentimes the second principle that we discussed about keeping the end in mind um, that sometimes gets lost, right, in all this transformation across, you know, and, and meeting end user needs within these different systems. So the data review process is still disjointed for users um, where they have to look across multiple systems to really put together a holistic picture of the data. So we move to the next slide. Um, this is, you know, basically the same depiction, but with a data lake inserted instead of a data warehouse. And you can see that this does change that data flow and creates efficiencies in the process. Um, the data only needs to be transformed once instead of twice. And that saves a lot of time and um, creates greater consistency in the downstream reviews. However, the project team is still with it, left with a disjointed and siloed process for monitoring operational monitoring and operationalizing the trial. So if we only aggregate the data to again, redistribute it downstream, we've really forfeited so many of the benefits brought forth from the data lake. And we've really um, reduced the capacity to advance automation and create deep learning through machine learning and AI algorithms. Um, so let's just discuss that a bit more on the next slide. And I know when thinking about the use of artificial intelligence to automate data reviews and bring new insights to the project team, 
Um, I think a good analogy to draw from is how we humans make sense of the world around us. Um, and I'm not an MD, so please forgive me for my rudimentary uh, analogy here. But let's just run through that, how the human body receives and processes stimuli. Um, so we all know the amount of stimuli a person takes in every second of every day is infinite and comes at us from all angles. Um, the primary way our body collects the stimulus is through our five senses. And the stimuli collected through our senses is then trans transmitted through the peripheral nervous system, specifically our som somatic nervous system as electrical signals and impulses. The somatic nervous system is, is basically an intricate network that transports and maps the electrical signal received to the targeted area of the brain for processing. And we all know the brain is broken into several parts or lobes that specialize in processing different types of stimuli. And even at a more granular level, um, they can differ, you know, they, they process different attributes of stimuli. So an example of this is like the occipital lobe processes visual stimuli relating to color and light and movement, while the parietal lobe interprets vis visual perception. So in order to really understand an image or something we're looking at, different lobes of the brain are connected and wired so that instantaneously we have a deep understanding of the image from multiple facets. And relating this back to clinical trials, this analogy and the three principles we've discussed, the raw data and modes of data collection are virtually infinite, as we know, and we must accept that we have limited control or influence over them. However, where we do have influence and control and where we can establish order is in the data transmission and data processing mechanisms. So in regards to data transmission, we already discussed the data lake and how that supports processing and transporting of, of data and mapping it. But what is needed to support end users and the advancement of machine learning and artificial intelligence is a centralized data processing environment. So for the sake of the analogy, if we stopped with just the implementation of a data lake, that would be the same as having data mapped to the individual lobes of the brain for end processing. And it would really completely discount um, the billions upon billions of neural connections and synapses between the various lobes of our brain that really allow us to kind of splice the data to form deep understanding and insight. Thus, as we approach how best to modernize clinical operations, we have to not only centralize the data, but also centralize how we process the data. So next slide. So this is my last slide, but it's really just a simple high-level depiction of Signet's cloud-based stack solution, which is powered by ThoughtSphere. Um, and it's a summation of several product layers in the same environment to really create an end-to-end -end intelligent platform. As you can see, the core of the product is the data hub, where the data is ingested and aggregated. And it leverages machine learning and standard data models to really automate the unification and mapping of disparate sources. The data hub serves then as the gateway that really empowers the subsequent product layers to function. And on the left side, you can see, you know, details and highlights and key features of each product layer. Um, I won't go into those in detail, but by stacking the data visualization tool, the risk-based quality management and data management workflows on top of the data hub, the data is no longer distributed to different users through different systems, but rather unified. And um, that really allows us to streamline data review processes um, for our end users. And it also sets the groundwork for robust, you know, machine learning and AI capabilities. And we're really on the cusp, I just wanna say, we're really on the cusp with what machine learning and AI can do, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty new, we can do a lot of things, but the, the deep knowledge synapses and how we can train data sets and, 
and refine them and the operations uh, behind machine learning is really just coming to fruition in these recent years. So we're really, you know, it's exciting time, but we have to set that groundwork, which means we have to be able to unify the data to enable that further growth within that arena. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Jason um, and then I think Jan. Thank you. Um, really interesting and uh, appreciate the, uh, the detail and the perspective. Um, I think at this time we'll uh, head straight into Jan if you want to uh, jump into your topic, leveraging data uh, to reimagine our way of working. Yes, let's, thanks Jason. So let's move to the next slide. Um, I have explained earlier that the complexity of our clinical trials is increasing and that we are pretty much struggling with the way we are working with the amount the variety with the speed and of course ultimately with the quality and integrity of the data um, so that's something that we need need to be dealing with um, that we really have to start looking at and think about rethink how are we doing our activities um, Christina already mentioned it, focus on what you can really control, um, let go on some other things. And regulators are also understanding that approach. I mean, they're telling us, start working with risk-based approaches. Um, so that is something that we have to do also if we really wanna get our cost for drug development under control. Let's move to the next slide. Um, what the way we look at a modern data intelligence platform as we see smart signals is a platform that can help us as a data lake change that paradigm to get to the timely and quality data. So thinking about the Vs, dealing with the four Vs, um, allowing us to get to the pertinent insights and in, in a fast time with the velocity as well. And of course, take the necessary actions that we can draw from the data. So, and all of that is as Christina explained, being enabled by automation, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Next slide. Um, so we're going back to the same image that Christina has had. Um, what, why do we see this? That why do we see smart signals as a modern data intelligence platform? Um, it's we have the APIs, of course, that's not something that is so modern. APIs as FTP uploads have been used in the past, also with data warehouses. That's not something that is making a difference, but a tool where you can have a smart engine that helps, with, that helps in mapping the data with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, supplemented with a visual mapping workbench. Um, that is a first step that, that's helping us to enable um, to enable to get the data all together in good quality to inject the data and start transforming the data and get them stored and ready for further processing. That's first element of a modern data intelligence platform. Um, on the second, on the next slide, we have the big component, which is all about the power of, of automation. Um, and with automation, you of course have different layers in that you have basic automation, um, where you're, sim where you're taking simple repetitive tasks, um, which can be about standards, which can be about programs. It can go up to deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence. So there's different levels of automation that we can do. Um, the big thing that we have, of course, is as Christina already explained, is the smart mapping engine, a machine learning and use of artificial intelligence in transforming the data that, that we are uploading and that we are putting um, in, the, in the data hub and processing it for further visualizations, analytics, uh, risk-based quality management, et cetera. So that's the very first big thing where we see um, a big benefit in. That is supplemented with other um, tools such as a, a automation engine, a smart risk engine that helps us to identify what are likely risks based on what, what we know from prior trials, um, automated creation of risk-based quality management actions based on triggers, alerts, prediction models, uh, where we can help, where we can forecast uh, when we have data breaches, um, smart data validation rules. So what can we learn from past studies, what are other checks that we are needing, um, up to basic things such as what is the review tracking, what's the cleanliness status, 
and what is the creation of edit checks and data reconciliations? How can we automate all of that? So putting a lot of automation in a system will, of course, um, streamline all the downstream processes, such as the monitoring part, quality management part, and data management part. And next slide. And when we really start processing all of that data, it's, of course, then further about visualizing it in the right way making it available, making it interpretable um, with visualizations, with dashboards, with patient profiles, KRIs, et cetera, that we can all use and an integrated risk and issue management that will help us then also um, take action, drive the necessary actions that we have to take and show that we are compliant with, for example, ICH E6. And that's how we see that Systems such as smart signals can really help us to, to leverage a new way of working and, of course, deal with, with the different challenges that we have in clinical trials nowadays. And with that, I will be handing also back to Jason. Thank you, Jan. Um, you, you know, as the, as the industry moved from paper to EDC, you know, we had the capabilities built in the EDC platform to raise queries, answer queries and correct data and have all that audit trail. And you could work a lot within that environment. And um, once that became commonplace, we saw the additional data sources show up and, and it's led us to this type of platform. But indeed with this, um, with this expansion, we have to look at the data now. We have to look at it with different tools. And so um, Gail's gonna talk us a little bit more, uh, a little bit more to us about the analytics that we can use on top of the platform. So I'll turn it over to Gail now. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jason. Uh, and I think it's a very good connection with what Ian just talked about, which is reimagine our way to work. Um, changing how we wanna collect this data, but also how can we use this data to maybe change how we work on the clinical trials, maybe earlier, maybe differently. So on my first slides, uh, which is now coming to you, we're gonna talk about why data analytics matter really, right? I mean, your study or your sponsor studies collect significant quantities of information. We talk about that from inception, to close out. Data analytics provides way to process data, organization of data based on your objective. Some visualization, some trains, some risk, you can call it smoke signal if you wish. And at the end, it offers a, a proactive management, allowing you to engage with your data in a meaningful way from drawing insights to predicting outcomes and making important decisions about resource allocation, for instance. So it's really about using this data, learning from what can you use from this data and what are the various data or modality you could get. As an example on the next slide, when we talk again about data analytics, these are an example of how Signal Health has been provided analytics and insight to its customer for long now. And we continue to expand, just like it has been explained, it has been explained to you. So about blinded data analytics, right? Which is really about identifying and act on the data trends with a collaboration on action planning. It's how you can optimize clinical endpoint data. We're talking about proactively review clinical assessment, audiovisual recordings, and monitor ongoing radar accuracy and consistency. Basically improve assessment quality. But it's also identifying changes in the data consistency and reliability as well as ensure some of the new timely corrective actions limit the data quality impact. So how to eliminate rate or inconsistency? Outcome analytics, proactively 
you resolve potential quality issues to ensure what your data integrity. An additional layer of quality control to your clinical data. Some algorithm and intuitive realization help study teams verify raters and sites are generating valid, verifiable, and accurate data. You identify threats to endpoint quality. You examine study at multiple levels to ensure consistent performance across raters, across sites, across regions, or even across studies, verifying all protocol adherence. Proactively intervene some correct issues that, if left unchecked, could propagate throughout your study data. All about prevention of data invalidation. So these are already things put in place, you can learn and already slide to help you to adjust. And when we say changing the way we work, it's us as a sponsor, us as a services organization, but also us as an actor of the study. And when we talk about study of a site, we're talking about monitoring clinical data quality throughout the trial with targeted and real-time data visualization. So let's talk about study of a site now in more details. So in the coming slide, at a high level, when we talk about study of a site, again, talking about monitoring clinical data quality throughout the trial, with visualization, performing a, a comprehensive 360 degree review of your patient safety using integrated data sources in one place as Christina and as Jan talked to you about and medical review and data management also integrated on one aggregated side of data. This is exactly how Christina talked to you about once all these data are in the data lake, how all the different view can be done and joined together on the same asset. You also heard previously this in this webinar. It's about risk-based quality monitoring and management. Having risk indicators that you select, that you define, and that you review for real targeted study monitoring. So, you saw that we talk analytics and oversight at a very high level, and then we start to go more and more into the detail. So now let's consider at which levels this oversight could be taken. So the next slide will give you a high level understanding about where and, and how all these could do. So we can talk about program, compound, or cross study, oversight, we can talk about site, study, sorry, study, site, or even patient level. So we can start to now think about the benefits that are offered by the study of a site at all these levels. What could be those benefits and what site and information can we use for that? So let's go to this level one by one now. Now we talk about cross study level. So you can get comparison of status and performance across all your trials. So these are some visuals to obviously maybe help you to think about, but I'm sure you may have already ideas in mind. We can think about recruitment summary and disposition trends. Can think about assess your study endpoints and monitor your study critical data. You could use safety trains by country, some protocol deviation and query trains, data quality metrics across your studies, data entry lags, and 
we can also think about these data entry lags just at the study level. But what about everything you can learn from pushing these to a higher level? And of course, not omitting any CRA visit analysis that helps you going forward. When it comes to site level, our next slide. I'm sorry, I was, yeah, study level. So you see, we're really about having a, an overview across all your functional services, right? You can assess your study, your bio study endpoints. You can monitor your study critical data. And when we talk about that, we're talking about some recruitment and summary disposition trains, uh, some safety trains, safety trains by country, some protocol deviations and query trains, data quality metrics, data entry lags. You remember we talked about that a few minutes ago at cross study, but can also apply to at this level, what are the data entry and the quality throughout this particular study? Going more into another level at the side this time, proactively identify the non-performing site, the top non-performing sites, putting in place all your, whatever you want to call it, risk indicator, performance indicator, or just indicators to identify where your study is not well run, accepted, understood. You can compare sites country average metrics with site information. Monitor and mitigate the risk. So through the use of site recruitment rate, safety trends by site versus the country average, trying to see how within the country, the site itself handles safety information a bit differently. Having recruitment and discontinuation trains. Follow your recruitment progression and find out if there is any particular site within a region, within the study that doesn't really recruit as the others and make it and learn from it so that the next time, the next study, you have this information. And you may think that in this particular country, things are pretty more difficult. Issue management, query resolution metrics, CRA actions. So you can build your site risk indicator dashboard. The lowest level that we're talking today is obviously the patient, the subject. What we can prevent any safety event, detecting outliers on critical, on critical data. Clinical data analysis for lab, vital signs, study endpoints. You could run your medical review on any clinical data and compare with any others, such as Adverse events versus concomitant medication analysis, patient reported outcome analysis, outlier, box plot range, and multi multi data comparison on all the previous points. So, in the last few slides, we've presented you um, various insight analytics, could be at, at the program or cross study level, at, at the study level, site, patient. We give you some example of outlines and, and risk indicators, but which one do you think is the most important for you? So Jason, I'll, I'll hand over for you to, to help our, our participant to go through this poll together. Thank you, Gail. Um, very, a very excellent summary of the, of the challenges of viewing and interpreting uh, data. So on this poll, on this Whole question, based on your own challenges and pain points, which of the following analytical strategies uh, do you find the most important? And so it's a multiple choice.
I think a lot of us have seen that the analytical tools are pretty mature in this space. And what's not mature is the normalization of data, the categorization of data, the tagging of data to get it into the tools in the right format. And so, you know, hopefully the strategies we've talked about uh, regarding uh, the data lake and how we normalize the data can make the uh, process of, of analysis and surveillance easier. And uh, clearly uh, one that as we add data sources, we, we need that flexibility. We need the flexibility to analyze. We need the, the power and capabilities to normalize the data. And uh, of course we need to be able to act on and create actions for results. So it sounds like uh, RBQM is uh, still standing out as, as one of the strong areas of need. Uh, as well as the traditional monitoring, medical statistical. Again, very helpful. Um, while we finish up this poll question, uh, we will take uh, some questions. So um, you're allowed to submit those questions using the QA button in your control panel. And um, if you would like, we could switch to uh, maybe a quick summary or we'll go straight to q and I think. Let's see in terms of questions how we're how we're doing. So maybe just to start off with a couple of questions we can ask. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting, as we look at this new technology, what types of skills do you need to complete the data mapping and standardization of the data that we've put in a platform, such as what we've described? You know, this is a, a non-traditional role and one that uh, typically uh, we don't necessarily have on staff, say in a CRO or within a sponsor. Um, and, you know, I wonder if, uh, Christina, you could take that question for us. What types of roles or skill sets do you really need to complete that data mapping and standardization from platform? That's a really good question. And honestly, we've seen it going different ways based on the organization and the, the team players and roles that they have. Um, you know, the mapping process and the mapping workbench is a very intuitive user-friendly setting where you can click and drag. So you know, AE term is this variable and drag it over. But additionally, it has extensions to like the STDM model or other models where you can write expressions to create derivations and calculations. So let's say you wanted to, um, you know, have an analytic downstream that that showed um, AE emergence related to how many days on treatment, active treatment they were. And so you wanted to calculate um, how many days on treatment a patient had been on. So that would require a simple expression um, using Java or, you know, a, a programming language to calculate that, to say what variables you would include in that. So it really depends. Multiple users can be in the work bitch at one time. So you may have, you know, uh, someone, I, I'm just thinking of typical roles we have today, CRF designers, they could do a lot of the mapping, but where it comes to creating derivations or things that are more custom, that's where you may need a little bit of an extra support. So more someone with a little bit of programming language and um, to be able to support that. And they can be in the same environment, working in the same workbench together. Um, so it, it really depends, it's flexible, but you're right. We don't have necessarily a niche role in most organizations that fit this need. It's really the cross pollination of a few roles that perhaps can be consolidated or work together to develop and, and do the mapping. Yeah, thanks, Christina. I, I think also it's important that, that you have a policy or, or, or an approach to, to map and do the mapping because once you, once you know what your target is and what you want to accomplish, uh, the different people can come together with a supportive programming teams or data management teams. But I think it's important to define what it is you want to do and, and what the output of that will be used and, and what it will drive. 
maybe to add, um, I think that, so, that such a system or configuring such a system is a great way to show how the classical data management rules are converging into a basically a data science role. But it's no longer a pure data management task, but you need some understanding probably of the programming side, probably of the statistical side as well. And to bring all of those skills and sets together to do the full understanding of why you are mapping data and what you are setting up and how it's going to be used. Great. So we've got a couple other questions that's come in. Uh, I'll read one of them. What has been your experience with dealing with data aggregation across sponsor studies, CROs, and managing data use rights for current and future analytic capabilities? This one's tricky. Um, my own experience uh, working at a CRO was that typically you needed consent to do things outside of a study. So while you could learn about trends in an anonymized fashion, you had to be very careful that you de-identify data that could be either identifying or could say uh, result in information, learning information outside the scope of, of what the data co was collected for and what the intention of the data was collected for. So I think it's really important that as you develop some of these, these questions and, and as you develop some hypotheses about what you might want to learn when you aggregate, to know that you can, you can do things uh, in a general way, but if you get specific, you need to make sure you have consent to do that. And that the, if you're at a sponsor, of course, you're one of the ones that you can, you can make that decision. If you're working on behalf of the sponsor um, or with sponsors data, uh, my advice is to make sure that, that you're allowed to do that because data privacy should be always the first and foremost, the front of your mind when you, when you do these types of approaches. You, with the power of aggregation and normalization, you unlock tremendous potential. Uh, at the same time, that potential can be harmful. So you really have to balance that and, and think first about who owns the data and, and what they've authorized you to do with it. Um, there was a, uh, actually a question uh, as well on the input hardware. Um, I think you obviously were, Sigmund is happy to, to speak about uh, what types of, of hardware sources and data sources we've used and have encountered. Um, Surprisingly, it's probably less diverse than you might think. Uh, they tend to be normalized around, um, uh, around maybe devices or certain types of devices for certain therapeutic areas or certain protocol modalities. Uh, and then from other data sources, of course, you have lab sources and others, the more traditional sources that if you can create adapters and, and uh, technology hooks, you can bring those into the platform a lot easier. And bringing them into a data lake is really sensible in that regard. Once it's there, of course, you have the power to transform in. Uh, then you're you're left with the, the challenge of normalization. And if you're if you can include technology, uh, data data management technology like tokenization, you can certainly simplify that. Uh, and uh, certainly, lots of information out there on the intersection of of those techniques with real world data and, and other types of approaches. Anyone else want to comment on on that from the panel? So I think in summary, um, again, hopefully we've we've covered some interesting topics for you and maybe sparked uh, some some ideas and some some thoughts. Um, but certainly we appreciate everything and uh, all of the time that you've taken today to to engage us. Um, this kind of concludes our exploration of the clinical data management approaches. Uh, we hope that you've gained some valuable insight in how to gain control of uh, what is really an exponentially growing volume of data uh, generated by our current clinical landscape. So uh, again, thanks to the panelists, uh, to all of you that attended and participated, and uh, to Signet for helping to sponsor and uh, assemble everything today. Um, we also have a, uh, a survey to provide feedback on the session. We would love to hear your feedback and um, uh, happy to uh, happy to improve and continue to offer these and, and sponsor uh, these conversations in the community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.